lose a bunch of guys. Okay, so that meant take the antiderivative of that stuff with respect to x. So that's all that means when you see that symbol. It's kind of the opposite of the d over dx of the stuff. Remember that dx just means with respect to. So some guys get confused on like what to do with that dx. It just means with respect to. Yeah, it looks like Great Hall is having a lot of issues. So maybe if you're nearby somewhere else, scooch. Otherwise, I'm recording this lesson and I'll post it later. Okay, so now to actually take the antiderivative of this, we're going to get equals and we're going to add one and then divide, right? Conrad, what do you get when you take the antiderivative of x squared plus one? I got one third x cubed plus x. I'm gonna call that x cubed over three plus just to c. clarify our process. So x cubed over three plus what? X plus C. And Conrad did not forget his plus C. Fantastic job. Excellent work. Don't forget your plus C's when you're taking an antiderivative. Excellent, excellent stuff. Okay. Oh, sorry. It sounds like the quiet room is also a disaster. You guys let Mr. Malloy know if there's issues later, but let's get out of the chat now. Sounds like lots of issues. <laughs> Let's just focus so we can get through this stuff. Okay. All right. Next one, number five. All of this stuff, add and then divide, only works with power functions, right? This is essentially the opposite of our power rule. So, what we need to do if we are trying to use this is we need to make sure we have a power function. On number five, we don't have a power function, we have a radical in there, but we can potentially write it as a power function. Remember, not all things can be written as power functions, this one can. So Ethan Balliser, how would you write three divided by the square root of X as a power function? Um, I would write three times X to the negative one half. So three times X to the negative one half. Now we haven't actually taken an antiderivative yet. So what we need to do is still include this symbol and still include our dx because we still have to actually take the antiderivative. Okay, now this is a little trickier because I've got negative exponents and I've got fractional exponents. The process is still the same. Be careful. You should not have something divided by an entire fraction. You should always be able to simplify these things. Please pay attention here. This uh, tends to be a very easy thing that guys miss all the time. So 3x to the negative one half, I start with three, I add one. So negative one half plus one is positive one half. I do not want you to write divided by positive one half down here. That would not earn you points. That is not what you should write. Instead of divide by positive one half, you have divide by one half. That's the process you can use every time. All you're doing is divide by, let me show you again, divide by one half. Then you don't have to change what you're saying. You know you're raising it to a one half, you're dividing it by one half, but it'll just make it a little easier to make sure you get those right answers. Divide by one half is the same as times two. So times two, we get two times three, we end up getting a six here, and then we have to remember our plus C. Okay, so we get six X to the one half plus C. What could you do to check that that answer is correct, Neil? What could you do given six X to the one half plus C, if we think that's our antiderivative, what could I do to make sure that that's right? Take the derivative. I could take the derivative of it, right? If I take the derivative, I should end up with three X to the negative one half, which I do. So if you're unsure if you've done it correctly, take the derivative and see if you get back to that original problem. Fantastic. Okay, now we get a little trickier because sine is a trig function. Sine is not a power function. So some guys will get to this one and they'll go two sine X, squared over two or something like that, which makes no sense because that's not how we take derivatives or antiderivatives of sine. Do you guys remember when we were talking about sine, I made us that little ladder, sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, and then back to sine. We could write that down. If I went down that ladder, I was taking a derivative. All you're doing to take the antiderivative is going the opposite way. We go up that ladder, we're taking the antiderivative. Another way to remember this is whatever you would get for the derivative of sine, if you just make that negative, that's gonna be the antiderivative. So for example, the antiderivative of sine x 
Well, I'm first going to think about what's the derivative of sine x. So the derivative of sine x is cosine, meaning the antiderivative is negative cosine. But this problem is even trickier because there's a two in front. Let's go to justice. What do you think the antiderivative of two sine x is equal to? Uh, negative two cosine x. You are very close. Uh, Sine x over. Someone? Anyone? Plus, plus C. C. Plus C, oh. Justice. Plus C. Oh my God. You did no credit because you didn't remember your plus C. So minus two cosine x plus C. Exactly right. So what Justice recognized, well, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. We're just going up that ladder by one. If I just have a number out in front being multiplied, that number just comes along and gets multiplied by the antiderivative, just like if you were taking a derivative. Now that works differently if you have like two X there. If you have a function times another function, right? We have different rules for those sorts of things with derivatives. We're gonna have different rules for those with antiderivatives. But if all you have is a number in front of your trig function, the number also just gets multiplied by your antiderivative. Fantastic job, let's keep going. We're gonna kind of change lanes here for a second. This is going to be a little easier. It's a little wacky. Make sure you're focused and paying attention. We're going to talk about something called Riemann sums. Riemann sums are used to approximate area under the curve. Literally, here's what we're doing. We're going to count up areas of rectangles. We're just going to add a bunch of rectangles together and we're going to add them up. That's it. It's really easy if you understand the process. Okay, this is actually a huge topic on my AP exam. This is on free response. This is worth several points. This is not hard math. This is not a hard setup, as long as you focus and pay attention here. Here's what I need you to write down. Riemann sums, make sure you know what that word is in your notebook somewhere. You don't need to write the definition, just write Riemann sums at the top of this. Write down f of x equals x squared plus one. I'll read you the question really quick. Given f of x equals x squared plus one with four equal sub intervals from zero to four, approximate the area under the curve. So we have four equal sub intervals and we're going from zero to four. Those are the basic things I need you to make sure you have in your notebook. F of X equals X squared plus one, four equal sub intervals and we're going from zero to four. And we're trying to use these rectangles to approximate area under the curve. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw X squared plus one. I'm gonna draw it kind of super zoomed in and pretty wide just to make this a little easier to work through. Okay, so here's my X squared plus one. We're just zoomed in so it's a little wider just to make this a little easier. Now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to approximate the area between that curve and the X axis from zero to four. So I'm gonna go from zero to four. Make sure you have this drawn and written down. And I want four equal sub intervals. Now, if I'm going from zero to four, that's four. That's a distance of four. If I want four equal sub intervals, that means each sub interval has a value of one, right? So I would be going from zero to one, from one to two, from two to three, and from three to four. Pretend those are equal, okay? Those are my sub intervals. Now, each of those sub intervals is going to create the base of a rectangle. So I'm going to have a base of a rectangle here. So this is my first base. So my base of that rectangle is one. All we're going to do is draw rectangles and then find their area. Now this is a left Riemann sum. So if I'm going from zero to one, the left part of that sub interval is the zero. That's the left part of that sub interval. So that zero is going to dictate the height of that rectangle. I'm going to start at that zero, the left side, and I'm gonna connect it to the curve and that's gonna be the height of that first rectangle. So that height, if I draw it over, is gonna come down like this. That's gonna be my first rectangle. I'm gonna just call that area one, just so we have something to label it as. For that area, again, area of rectangle is just base times height. So we're going to do every time. So that area one, well, my base is from zero to one. So that's just a base of one. My height is F of zero. We'll go back and fill in what those actual values are, but it's going to be helpful for you in your notes to see that it's called F of zero. 
And now we're going to keep going. So that next rectangle is the rectangle from one to two. And between one and two, my left side is one. So one is going to dictate the height of that rectangle. I'm going to draw up from one, connect to the curve, and then draw over. That's going to be area two. Area two is going to be a base of one times a height. We used the x value to dictate the height. So that would give me f of one for that height. Next one is going to be between two and three. Two will dictate our height. We connect that to our curve, draw down. That's area three. Area three is going to be equal to one times f of two. Finally, area four. So we're going from three to four. We use three to dictate the height. We draw over to four. That's going to be area four, which is going to be one times f of three. Okay, again, I don't want to use f of four. Like some guys will keep drawing. They'll have like here and go over at this point. I don't want that because it specifically wanted us to go from zero to four. So I'm like restricted to this part of my graph. That's the only part of the graph I want to include. And so that part of the graph, I've split that into four equal sub intervals, meaning the bases of those rectangles are the same. And then I use the left side of each of those rectangles to dictate the height. So let's go ahead and calculate what this area would be now. Uh, F of zero just means take this function, plug zero in. So we get zero squared plus one, that's one. One times one is one. If we plug one in, we get one squared plus one, that's two, two times one is two. F of two is equal to four plus one, which is five. F of three is nine plus one is 10. Add those up, we get eight plus 10, 18. That's our area. That's it. That's the whole process. We're going to show you how to show your work a little neater for the AP test, but this is the actual process of a challenging question on the AP exam. Now, uh, question, do you think this is an under approximation or an over approximation compared to the actual area under the curve, Gus? Do you think this would be an under approximation or an over approximation? Under. Under, why? Because we, um, since we're using the left Riemann sum, we're not getting all the area under the curve. Yeah, we've got like these little pieces left right here, right? So those those little pieces left that we're not accounting for. And so yes, it would be an under approximation. That's also a question you might be asked on the AP exam, right? Is it an under approximation or over? This is under, we can see from our graph. Okay, let's do a right Riemann sum. Same process, just we're gonna start from the right hand side. So same graph, I'm still gonna give you f of x equals x squared plus one. We're still going from zero to four. We still have four equal sub intervals. So I'm going to draw my graph. Oh, that was terrible. Here we go. Okay, again, I have x squared plus one. I don't need it to be perfect. That was terrible. Okay, something like this. And we're going from zero. I'll put four over here. So we go from zero to one, one to two, two to three. So bad at spacing. This Toshner. Yes, sir. So if if your like sub intervals are like the smaller your sub intervals, does that make your approximation more accurate? Absolutely. Excellent observation. Yes, absolutely. If my sub intervals are smaller, it's going to make it more accurate. Totally. Good question. We're going to talk about that in a little while. Okay. Or if I have more sub intervals, which is the same idea, right? Smaller bases. So if I have more rectangles, I'm going to get closer and closer to my real answer. Great job. Okay, we're going to do a right Riemann sum. Again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Here's what's helpful. If you're doing a right Riemann sum, start on the right side. That'll help you. Start on the right side. So I'm going to have my first rectangle this time is going to be my rectangle from three to four. And of three and four, since it's a right Riemann sum, the right part of that base is going to dictate my height. So I'm going to draw up from here, and that's going to be the height of my rectangle. So the right-hand side dictates the height of the rectangle this time, and I get this. Again, I'm going to call this one area one this time, area one in this case, base of one, height, whatever the height was at four, the right side of that base. The next one is going to be the height from three. So one times f of three, the next one is the height at two. One times f of two, the last one is the height at one. 
and we get this stopped labeling a lot of stuff along the way. Okay, you'll notice I didn't use zero this time. I don't have f of zero as part of this list and I don't need it because if I did include an f of zero, I've gone past what I want to include over here. Right, I don't need to include that. All I want is the area from zero to four and I want four subintervals. Subintervals means four rectangles, by the way. That's the number of rectangles I should end up having if there's four equal subintervals. Now we're just going to calculate this. Uh, f of four is equal to, let's go to Gus. What would f of four be equal to? Uh, 17. Fantastic. And then we're just multiplying by one. Your base is not always one, by the way, but in this case, our base is one. Uh, f of three would equal what, Gus? Uh, 10. F of two? Five. F of one? Two. Fantastic. If we add those up, looks like we get 17 plus 17, which is? 34. Fantastic. So next question guys ask, well, our right Riemann sum is over by this little amount, right? Our left Riemann sum was under by a little amount. What if we average them? Will that get us the exact answer? Mm, no, it won't, but it will get you closer. So if you average those two things together, what's actually gonna happen if we were to zoom in on like one of those rectangles? So we've got this curve here. Let's say I had my left rectangle that looks like this, so it was under. And then I had for that same spot, my right rectangle, which was over like this. If we were to take the average, that's a terrible drawing. If we were to take the average of these two things, what would happen is it would take this spot and this plot, and it would create a secant line between them. So it's still not the actual area under the curve because the actual area is under this curve, right? We would want this area. And what we find if we average them together is we still get a little bit extra, but it's closer. It would be closer than both of those. The average, please write this down, of a left Riemann sum and a right Riemann sum, I'm just abbreviating that, LRS and RRS, the average of a left Riemann sum and a right Riemann sum is a trapezoidal Riemann sum. There's actually four types of Riemann sums we're gonna do. The third one is a trapezoidal and it's the average of a left and a right. And there's another way that you can calculate that also. Okay, but the reason it's that is because it produces instead of a rectangle, it produces this trapezoid, right? You end up with this trapezoid shape if you take the average of the left and the right. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so how do we find the actual area under the curve? Because all of these are approximations. All of these can be good approximations or helpful approximations, but none of these are the exact value. So now we're gonna actually find the exact value of that area under the curve. So the actual area under f of x equals x squared plus one from zero to four is what we're gonna do now. And we're gonna use antiderivatives to do that, which may not be an obvious thing. So we are going to take the antiderivative of x squared plus one with respect to x, make sure you have this written down. And we're gonna add something to this antiderivative in order to find the area from zero to four. What we're gonna add are called bounds. These are called bounds of integration. And I'm going to add these to my antiderivative. And again, I said an integral and an antiderivative are essentially the same thing. So bounds of integration are going to get added to this. We were going from zero to four. That's what we wanted to go from and to. From zero to four is what area we wanted to cover. So I'm going to put a zero on my bottom bound, meaning the bottom of that antiderivative symbol. And I'm going to put a four on the top of that bound the top of that antiderivative symbol. We're gonna take our antiderivative just like we did already before of x squared plus one first. I think we even did that in a couple slides previous. I can't remember who did that for me, but we found the antiderivative of x squared plus one and we found that that's x cubed over three, right? So we add and then divide plus 
x so some guys will just think that that's the answer or this plus c they'll forget about actually taking the antiderivative of one remember one is one x to the zero so we end up with one x to the one divided by one which is just plus x and then plus a c so so far the process is the same all we did was take the antiderivative of that function but now this is not our final answer now we're going to incorporate our bounds of integration and here's how we're going to draw a vertical line, a straight line right after that C. This is actually important that you have this setup correct. So draw a vertical line after that C. Augie, I look like I've lost you. Focus, draw a vertical line. And then on the bottom of that line, we're gonna have a zero. On the top of that line, I'm gonna have a four. So we're gonna have a zero on the bottom and a four on top. Should not have a squiggle integration sign anymore. We already took the integral or the antiderivative. We should just have a vertical line. Now what we do is we plug in the top bound first in for all of the X's. So I'm going to take each of those X's and I'm going to plug in my top bound for each of those. Throw a big parentheses around that. So that's me plugging in my top bound. Then I'm going to subtract plugging in my bottom bound. So I'm going to have zero cubed over three plus zero plus C. So all I did was plug in my top bound first, no matter what, no matter if your top bound is smaller or bigger or whatever, you always plug your top bound in first and then you subtract plugging in your bottom bound. Okay, now something will happen every single time we have bounds. And what will happen every single time that I have bounds is that the C's are gonna cancel out. So you'll notice I had a plus C and then minus another plus C. Anytime you have bounds, your C's are going to cancel out. Now, the whole right side of that also is pretty simple because everything just turns into zero. That won't always happen. I tried to pick a simple example. Okay, so we get like zero cubed over three, that's zero, plus another zero, that's zero. So that whole thing also goes away. So now we're just left with 64 over three, that's four cubed. And I need to add four to that. So I'm gonna make a common denominator. We're gonna have plus 12 over three. And then that gives me 76 over three. 76 over three, this is the actual area under that curve. That's the actual area if we were to find it. And the way that this came about is actually, I forget who asked the question, but taking infinitely many rectangles. Oh, Fallon. So if we had infinitely many rectangles, if we took the limit of all of those rectangles being infinite, what we end up with is this process. We find the antiderivative and we have these bounds and we plug them in. So that actually all goes together. That's these Riemann sums. If we had infinitely many, we end up with this process. I'm just skipping the proof because it's not that exciting. Question. No. So when we're, um, so like, you know how when we're taking the derivative, we're finding the average rate of change. When we're giving the derivative and going backwards, what are we finding? Or is it just like the original function period or is it like that, is that actually something? So it depends. That's a very good question. So you said one thing incorrectly. You said when we take the derivative, we're finding the average rate of change. We're not, we're finding the instantaneous yeah. rate of change. I think you just misspoke. I just wanted to clarify that. So when we're taking the derivative, we're finding the instantaneous rate of change. When we are taking the antiderivative, you said it correctly, we are going back to the original function. If there's no bounds, if there's no bounds on that antiderivative, then what we're doing is we're essentially going from like an F prime to an F. Or we could think about it in terms of motion. So if we take a derivative of position, we get to velocity. If we take an antiderivative of velocity, we get back to position, right? So it goes the opposite way. Now this changes if we have bounds of integration. If we have bounds of integration, what we're finding is we're finding area under a curve specifically. And that could represent different things depending on the context of our situation. We're gonna talk about what that could mean. In one situation, finding an area under a curve might be a total distance traveled. So it actually can represent more information than just area, okay? We'll talk yeah. about lots of examples where this comes in. Great question, Justice. All right, let's do some more stuff. So now we're going to do some practice. We're going to evaluate these. First one, A, says we're going to go from 0 to pi of sine x dx. Again, that dx just means with respect to x. If this was like a sine of t, you'd have a dt. Or a sine of y, it'd be a dy. Just tells you what you're taking it with respect to. OK, so we first need to take the antiderivative of that. That's the first process. The antiderivative of sine 
Again, you can either use that like little chart of information or you can just think what's the derivative and then flip it and make that thing negative. So the antiderivative of sine of X, Mateo would be what? What's the antiderivative of sine X? Negative cosine. Negative cosine. X plus C. There we go, plus C, okay. Now, the next thing I need to draw is this little vertical line. And on that vertical line, I'm gonna put whatever my bottom bound was on the bottom and whatever my top bound was on the top. They need to sort, they need to match. So you can't flip the bounds at this point, okay? And now my process is I'm gonna plug in that value on top first. The top bound always gets plugged in first. That's gonna give me negative cosine of pi plus C, parentheses, minus parentheses, negative cosine of zero plus C. You need to know your trig values. You need to know your unit circle. It's incredibly important. Otherwise you're gonna get stuck on a basic problem like this. Now, what I said, always when you have bounds, the C is gonna cancel out. So it's the first thing we're gonna do. We're gonna cancel out those Cs. Anytime I have bounds, the Cs are gonna cancel out. Now I need to evaluate these two cosine values. I need to think about what the cosine is over here at pi, right? And then what the cosine is over here at zero. Those are the two cosines I need to think about. As a refresher, cosine just means the X coordinate. So I'm just thinking about the X coordinate. Over here at pi, I'm in this, this like, but on the left side, meaning my X is negative. And specifically my X would be negative one. Like the coordinate there would be negative one zero. For cosine, all I care about is the X. So negative cosine of pi is negative, negative one. Cosine of zero means the X coordinate over here at zero. Well, the coordinate there would be one zero. So cosine of zero is positive one. I have minus minus, so that's just plus. So I get plus one, which gives me negative, negative one plus one, which is a value of two. So that would be my value at that point. I get a value of two. Nathan Wise, what did I actually just find? Like, what is two in terms of this problem? Um, the um, actual area. Under what curve? Um, under the sin, sine x uh, dx. Under the curve of sine x, yes, it's just yeah. the curve of sine x. Dx is just with respect to. From where to where, Nathan? Uh, zero from zero to pi. Perfect. You got it. So if I have this sine graph, most of you know or remember what sine looks like. Sine looks like this. What we found is we found the area going from zero to pi right here. This area under this curve, it's just exactly two. I always find that very fascinating. With all the weird values we get for sine, the actual area under that curve, it's just two. Just simplifies down to whole number of two. Okay, harder question. What do you think I would get if I went from pi to two pi of this exact same function. So still sine of x dx. Charlie, what do you think I would get if I went from pi to two pi? So here's pi right here, here's two pi. Any guesses on what I would get there? Um, just like my first thought would probably be two again. So that's a very, very close answer. It seems like that would make sense, right? If this area is two, this area should also be two. There's a slight change to that answer. Do you have a second guess? If you had to guess a second thing, knowing two is close, but not quite right? Negative two. Negative two well, is exactly it can't right. Be a ne okay. Negative two is right. Now I know we've talked about can't be negative area. Anytime we're below the x-axis, we're going to consider the area negative. Anytime that area exists below the x-axis, that is going to be considered negative area. Okay, so yes, you're exactly right. Your gut instinct, negative two, correct. Okay, let's go to a harder question. Nico, what if I took the integral from zero to two pi of this same function? What do you think I would end up with? Zero. I would end up with zero. Why is that true, Nico? Because two plus negative two is equal to zero. Exactly, we had an area of two up here. We had an area of negative two here. If I'm looking at the whole thing, what's above the x-axis and what's below the x-axis perfectly cancel out. So I just get a total of zero there, okay? Excellent job. 
All right, let's go on to this next question from negative one to one of X cubed. I'm gonna give you like one minute to solve it, go. By yourselves. Everyone solving B, go. Aiden Lynn, what'd you get? Uh, I, I was almost done. I'm not finished yet. Okay, uh, I'll give you another couple seconds to finish, then unmute and tell me what you got. Okay. Aiden, do you have it? Yeah, uh, I got a zero. Perfect, zero. Now, let's see if that answer makes sense. We had the curve x cubed. That curve looks like this. What we were finding was the area from negative one to one. And we're finding it between the curve and the x-axis. So we're finding the area like right here between this curve and the x-axis and the area right here between this curve and the x-axis. Aiden, why do you think we got zero? Um, cause if you, uh, Gus, you think, you know, uh, yeah, I think it can help him out. It's cause like, uh, we're going one on the like X we're going like positive one, negative one. So it's like, we're kind of like, I think of it as like a number line. We're going like over one back one. So end up canceling out. Yeah. And it's not the fact that this is negative and that this is positive. It's the fact that part of it is above the x-axis and the exact same amount is below the x-axis. That's the reason we end up getting zero, okay? Because I could potentially go from negative one to one of a curve like this, like an x squared plus one curve. If I went from negative one to one there, I would end up with some positive answer because everything would be above the x-axis. The reason we get zero here is because the amount above the x-axis is the same as the amount below the x-axis. So they end up canceling out, we get zero. Fantastic job. Okay, we have a couple minutes left. I might come back to this slide in just a second. Uh, we were talking about this kind of a question earlier, so I wanna make sure I hit this question. So uh, we're trying to determine f of x. So that's what we're trying to find. You can write find f of x if that's a faster word to write. So find f of x, we are given f double prime of x. So we're given the second derivative, f double prime of x equals 12x minus 10. Then we're given two additional pieces of information. We're given f prime of one equals four and f of zero equals negative six. So we are trying to go from f double prime all the way to f, meaning I'm gonna have to take some antiderivatives to get there, right? Here's our process. We're first going to take the antiderivative of 12x minus 10 with respect to x. Don't forget your dx there, okay? We have to know what we're taking it with respect to. When we take the antiderivative of that, again, we're gonna add one and divide by that number, add and then divide. We get 12x squared over two minus 10x to the first over one plus c, which simplifies to 6x squared minus 10x plus c. Now this portion over here, this portion was equal to f double prime of x. So when I take the antiderivative, what function do I end up with, Matt Graf? f prime of x. I end up with f prime of x, right? I'm going one more in the opposite direction. So I go from f double prime to f prime of x, okay? 
Now at this point, we can use this information up here. We are given information about what F prime of one is equal to. So I forget who asked before, but said we didn't have enough information to solve for C. This is the kind of information that we could be given to actually solve for C. We could be given something called an initial condition. That's often what they'll call it. Okay, so we can be given some piece of information about F prime in order to figure out what our C was. So since F prime of one equals four, that means if I plug in one into this equation, I will end up with four. Now C is just C, you're only plugging one in for the X values. So we plug in one to each of those things, we get four is equal to six minus 10 plus C. That's four equals negative four plus C. If I add that over, I get C is equal to eight. All I did was plug that information in and I got C is equal to eight. That tells me F prime of X is this same equation, but all I have to do is substitute in my C. But we weren't looking for F prime of X. We wanna go all the way back to F of X. So to go all the way back to F of X, we're gonna take another antiderivative. Now we're gonna take the antiderivative of this function. So we're gonna get the antiderivative of six X squared minus 10 X plus eight with respect to X. We're gonna get six X cubed over three minus 10 X squared over two plus eight X plus C. I know the bell probably just rang. I'm gonna keep finishing this problem if you wanna hang on. Otherwise, you know, class is over, you can go. This is two X cubed minus five X squared plus eight X plus C. Since this thing was equal to F prime of X and we took the antiderivative of it, where we are now is at F of X, which is the thing we're trying to find. So all we now need to do is find out what C is. And so we're gonna use our other piece of information. We were told F of zero equals negative six. Meaning if I plug a zero in for each of those X's, we're gonna get zero minus zero plus zero plus C. C is gonna be equal to negative six. That allows me to come up with my final equation. F of X equals two X cubed minus five X squared plus eight X minus six, final answer. Okay guys, that's it. Have a great weekend, be safe, make good choices. I will see you Monday, I'll stay on. If anybody has any questions, feel free to hang. Otherwise have a wonderful weekend, great job. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank Ms. you, Ms. Tasha. I had a question. Thank you, guys. Yeah, go ahead, Nico. You know when the tests will be graded? Like uh, what... This weekend. So this this weekend? weekend, they'll be up. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Thank you. Yep. See ya. JJ, what's up? Cool. Yes, and I know it's, it's probably very annoying when students do this, but just so you know, I really, I really, really did do that quest. I mean, I spent a lot of time. I know. So I just know. to make sure. Even, I'm yeah. going to think about it. I had one other student. I know that's a big, big point value. I had one other student have a similar issue. So I'm, I'm debating. Usually I, you know me, I'm strict on my policies, but I might make an exception for this one because yeah, it was a big one. Asked Mr. Mass for chemistry last year. I was notorious for the white, the white sheet PDF. <laughs> you so can always check it JJ in advance. So whatever you see when you upload, if you, like once you upload and you click it, whatever you see is what I'm going to see. So right. If you're ever worried it uploaded as a random white PDF, just click on it and you'll see what I see. Okay. Well, cool. cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. No, no problem. Have a good weekend.